الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ما بعد هو يتسير في جمانتي ما وحجة وتفنائي ورسميت برادر وسيستر السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for partaking in not only what is a noble event, but something that can be built upon for many of our other Adelia, granting this opportunity to really understand. And I think the fact that we have such a good turnout is testimony <coughs> to how these sorts of events are the ones that need to be kept. What is the philosophy of Thursday night? The first thing for us to appreciate is that everything has a beginning and everything has an end. So whether that be you or I, or whether it be the uh, universe itself, everything has a beginning and end. Everything in the creative world has a beginning and an end. In terms of the year, in terms of our annual progress and trying to assess where we are from year to year, it can be different times, it can be very personal. It could be that I start my spiritual year with the first of Muharram and then end it again with the beginning and try to understand my progress through the event of this calendar year. Or maybe it would be that some of the um, spiritually orientated hearts and minds have even stated that the night of Qadr or Liyali al-Qadr should be the nights of the beginning and the end of your year. Meaning that when you come to the night of Qadr, let's just say it is the 23rd of Shahr Ramadan, that on that night I begin my year and I end my year in itself. Why begin and why end my year upon this one day? Because everything that I had pledged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to a conclusion again that particular night, doesn't it? And that everything that had been set for me from the previous Laylatul Qadr Everything that had been set for me in terms of, be it my rizm, or be it in terms of my tawfiq, be it in terms of where I'm going to go, everything concludes again, doesn't it, on that night. As in the previous year, it was written and dictated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such and such things will occur in accordance with my interaction with that night, in accordance with my presence of heart and mind on that night. And therefore the year comes to an end on Qadr, but at the same time it begins on the same night, doesn't it? Because again, I re-pledge myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon my physical, spiritual, mental, emotional presence on that night. My year begins again, doesn't it? Because again on that night I expect that things are written for me, I expect that my rizq will be set for me, I imagine my tawfiq will be set for me. So the year begin and year end is on the night of Qadr. But it's very interesting because if you read some of the tafsir, you have the statement that it is recommended for you and I to recite Surat al-Qadr on a Thursday night. We have certain chapters that are recommended for Thursday nights. For example, we have the chapter of Surah Al-Isra that is recommended. There is the narration from Imam Ja'far Salih, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He says, He who recites Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17 of the Holy Quran on a Thursday night, will not die until he visions, until he sees and meets with the awaited Savior of humanity. Or we have, for example, another hadith which recommends us that on a Thursday night and Friday day to recite Surah Al-Jum'ah. Amongst the recommendations for the Thursday night is to recite Surah Al-Qadr. Now think about this. There's a question. Well, why recommend Surah Al-Qadr on a Thursday night? What difference does it make if I didn't recite it or if I do recite Surah Al-Qadr on a Thursday night? For example, in my Maghrib or my Isha Salah and so on and so forth. Amongst the views, the concept behind instituting the regular recitation of Surah Al-Qadr on the Thursday night is to bring to mind the beginning and the end of the year. That which you did culminated on that night of Qadr and that which you pledge again for the forthcoming year and which is dictated in the unseen realms 
is on the Laylatul Qadr. And therefore, to institute the reminder that the beginning and the end of your week is Thursday night and Friday day. The same way I bring to mind that my beginning and my end of my year is Qadr night, the beginning and the end of my week is Thursday night, Friday day, spiritually speaking. Again, this becomes important because the same way I approach the end of my year, Qadr, with that intensity, that realization that I'm now standing on the night of grandeur, I'm supposed to approach Thursday night with the same concept that I'm approaching it, that this is the greatest night of the week. And in the same way that I conclude my week, I begin my week the same way I begin on the night of Qadr. That there is a re-pledge of allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from my heart. There is the assessment of what I did throughout my whole year in Qadr. And therefore I begin to pledge what I'm going to change for the forthcoming year from Qadr onwards. In the same way that the whole week arrives at Thursday night with the understanding of the revision of what I've done for my week, Thursday night is that chance to re-pledge the beginning of your week until the following Thursday. In the week just gone, I did X, Y, and Z. Good. My Lord, help me to continue and improve on that. And also my review of my week is, my Lord, I did X, Y, and Z. Bad. I fell short in such a way in this week. Thursday night is your night of grandeur. Therefore, forgive my sin, and this Thursday night I re-pledge the allegiance that in the forthcoming week you won't see me commit those same ill deeds. Can you see the concept of Thursday night? How it's sanctified, that it's the beginning and the end of your week in the very same moment. It is the ending of the week to bring finality on what's been done, and it's the beginning of the week for you to pledge as to what you want to achieve in that forthcoming week. If we approach Thursday night in that way, we would really begin to appreciate the grandiosity of this particular night. It's not just a night to come and the Akumeyer and Ziarwalatha and a bunch of you know, different um, things that our community does. No, no, it's, it's real. There's something taking place in the unseen realm. Just the way there is on the night of Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has devolved that spiritual authority to the night of Thursday night. This is why we have so many ahadith on the reverence of Thursday night. Just one or two to give you an example for us to contemplate over. And then I want to go into something very contemporary for you and I to appreciate about, appreciate about the value of Thursday night. One or two hadith. We have one narration which states to us from Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam that on the Thursday night he who does good their reward is doubled and on Thursday night he who does sin his sin is doubled now here I don't want you to think in basic terms of like a child who is being handed out sweets when they do good or a sin, you know, in this literal balance that we see of the weight and the scales. I want you to think deeper than that. If Thursday night is supposed to be this revered night, which is the beginning and end, spiritually speaking, of your week, what difference does it make to double up good and to double up bad? As in, if I was to go to the club on Thursday night, or the casino on the Thursday night, I'm actually getting double the sin, according to this hadith. So every card I turn, or every you know, song I listen to, or whatever it may be at the level I want to quantify it at, I'm getting double the sin. But then when I come to the mosque, the Imam Barha, or the Husayniya, or I come to Al-Mahdi, and so on and so forth, and I listen to the Akumail and Sheikh Fanai, and, 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 I'm getting double the reward. Is that really what's meant? Is that really the understanding I take away from such a beautiful hadith? No. It means that on the Thursday night, the fact that it's such a revered night, in the same way that on Laylatul Qadr, my heart is so open and I'm so ready to act for the sake of God, every deed I do has double merit within the growth of my own soul. And in the same way, if I have the audacity to commit a sin on the night of grandeur and be the same person that I am 
pre-Maghrib as I was post-Maghrib on the night of grandeur, really, it can only be you're actually going twice as backwards in your own human soul. Really, the sin is double, isn't it? Because I'm actually going backwards. If I'm willing on such a great night, it's like me saying to you, come the day of Ashura, come the day of Ashura, it's a sanctified day, isn't it? You know the value of that. Are you going to go to the club on that day? On the night of Sham e Gariba, am I going to go to the casino on that day? The point would be how hard, how backward a soul would I have to be to recognize <coughs> the sanctity of that day, that night, and still go to such a horrid spiritual place. Fair? In the same way on the Thursday night, it has such a sanctity to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger, wanted us to know that on that night, if I'm willing to sin on a Thursday night when the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so overflowing, when the concept of community is so great, when the different when the different things I can perform on a Thursday night are so evident, if I'm willing to go and kick Thursday night out of my spiritual development, really the heart is so closed that you're going backwards double than what you would be on any other time. But more importantly, on the same way, he who takes Thursday night seriously, because of how the unseen realm is, because of the efforts you put in on the Thursday night, the good that you do potentially has the value to double up. It's not literal reward. What is reward? Reward is your own humanity. Reward is how you change from day to day, month to month, year to year. That is how to discern your own reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in the Holy Quran in regards to salah. When he says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munka. The concept, the purpose behind your salah is to remove those sins and make you change as a person. On Thursday night, the reward is doubled, meaning your own soul can grow at twice the pace because of what sanctity is applied to the Thursday night. So here the Thursday night comes with that endeavor that is like my week's qadr. It's like the effort that I want to put in for qadr, I should put in for Thursday night. What do I do in qadr? The first thing is, I make sure that I have sought for forgiveness from all my friends and family. I put out that silly text message and that Facebook update and that tweet that says, on this night, if I've done any wrong for you, forgive me. Because I want to come away completely clean, don't I? Now actually, the concept is that on Thursday night, I arrive at a point where I'm aware of my deeds. In the same way on Qadr, I perform a ghusl to cleanse myself emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. On a Thursday night, I should also come having performed a ghusl if I can. Because it starts me afresh for that particular night. And then, of course, there are certain good deeds to be done on the night of Qadr. We are recommended in the same way we are recommended certain deeds on a Thursday night. Tonight, we are having a special one for one of those, the Aquaman. Now, I want to assume you already know the merits of the Aquaman, especially if you're already regular attendees, you will know it. If you don't, the doctor will probably elaborate better than I ever can. I want to provide you with one verse. And I want us to look at it in a very contemporary light. And I want us to understand the value of Thursday night beyond you and me at a global level. I want us to understand Thursday night. I want us to understand it in light of our friends and family that may not engage in Thursday night in the way you and I want to engage in Thursday night. Alhamdulillah, the fact that you've, you've turned up, the fact that you're here, shows Thursday night means something to you. Shows the Akamel means something to you. So I'm preaching to the converted, maybe. But for my own soul, and for your own friends and family, when we talk about the value of coming on a Thursday night to the mosque, Imam Barha, Hussainiyah, how do we demonstrate the importance of that to someone else? I want to show you a beautiful verse. It's in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 24. I'm going to read parts of it, and then we're going to just do a little bit of commentary on it. Assalamu alaikum. And then we're going to try, I'm going to open it up to you. I'm going to ask you one or two questions if you don't mind. So if you're one of those people who are embarrassed when someone asks you a question, puts you on the spot, look down so I know to choose you. <laughs> the verse says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, 
مثل الحياة الدنيا كماء أنزلناه من السماء فاختلط به نبات الأرض The similitude, the likeness of this world, life, how this world's life is, it's just like what we send down from water, from the cloud. It's like we send down rain, cloud. What happens is herbage grows, cattle eat, and so on and so forth. Meaning that this life is like a cycle. It continues on, doesn't it? Where were you last week? The week before, the week before that, life just continues, doesn't it? We have our cycles, we have our responsibilities, family, studies, work, we set the alarm, we go to sleep. It continues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely this life is like a cycle, that the rain comes from the sky, that the herbage grows, the cattle eat, and everything continues. Then he says something brilliant. Hatta, until when? Hatta ila akhadat al زخرفها وزينت وظن أهلها أنهم قادرون عليها أتاها أمرنا ليلا أو نهارا. All of this cycle continues week to week, month to month, year to year, century to century. It just continues. حتى until when a time will come when the earth puts on its golden raiment. And it becomes garnished, adorned, beautified. And at that point, its people will think that they have power over this world. Then our command comes by night or by day. Have you seen the structure of the verse? Very simple. This world continues on in its cycle. It will continue on <coughs> in its normal things. People will live, people will die, the world continues. Until when? Meaning that there will come a point where this structure, this cycle, shifts. There's a change in the pattern of what's going to happen in the station of normality. Until when? One day, the earth will put, up, put on its golden raiment and adorn itself beautifully. At that time, when the earth is garnished, people will think to themselves that they have power over this earth. At that point, our command comes by night or by day. Let us explain this verse. This verse is a verse about the signs of the coming of the awaited Savior of humanity, Imam al Hajjah Abdul Allah Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. This war will continue on until the earth comes to a point that this world will become garnished and beautified and adorned. Let me ask you, if you look at today, Dubai, if you look today, for example, New York, would you not say that the earth has become garnished and beautified? If I ask you, you know there's a picture normally you get from a satellite, it's like um, the earth at night. Go to www.darksky.org if you get a chance tonight. And you know you get those pictures of the whole continent of Europe lit up by lights. You know, you get city after city after city just adorned in lights. Look at this verse. The earth will continue on until when the whole earth becomes garnished and adorned with its beautifications. At that time, not before, when the earth becomes adorned and beautified. At that time, man, mankind, man will think that they have power <coughs> over the earth. SubhanAllah. What is it talking about? Ego. It's talking about th people thinking that they actually have control over this earth. Now that verse couldn't have been revealed about someone like Fir'aun, could it? Because Fir'aun <coughs> geographically was confined, wasn't he? It wasn't the whole earth that he thought he had control over. And it can't be about someone like Yazid ibn Muawiyah, can it? Because again, he didn't believe that he had control over Persia, or over Rome, or over the parts of the world that hadn't even been found yet. He just believed he had control over the Muslim Ummah. Meaning that this verse is about a time when individuals think that they have power over the whole world. Now, just as a question to you, do 
you think today it might be that certain people think that they have power over the whole earth? Drop me a name. Obama. It might be. I wouldn't disagree. It might be if you said to me, President Obama thinks that the reality is he can have control and power. He can dictate just like, you know, that puppet master dictates the movements that take place. Do you think President Obama, or definitely George Bush, I would say, was one of them? Would that be a fair point? What about someone like Rupert Murdoch? Yes? Someone who, I mean, today I saw the front page of The Sun at the uh, at petrol station. The, the, the intelligent um, front page newspaper was um, Killer Spider Attacked My Baby Daughter. And so, mashallah, that's definitely the first most important news story in the world. Killer spiders attack my baby girl, shaking my head. So here we have individuals that actually think that they have power over this earth, don't they? They think they have control over it. Look at the verse again. This world will continue until, until what? Until the earth puts on its beautification, its adornment, its golden raiment. One. Two, mankind think that they have power over this world. Three, at that point, our command comes by night or by day. What does that mean? It makes sense to me, the first part of the verse, doesn't it? Okay, world will continue, stage by stage, until it gets to a point of industrial revolution, until it gets to a point where the cities are so huge and lights and electricity makes sense and when that time comes mankind will think that they have control over this whole world I can see it in front of me but the last part of the verse doesn't make sense at that point our command God says our command will come by night or by day now there was a Lebanese <coughs> Christian very famous Lebanese Christian by the name of Professor Haddad. Many people would have heard of him. He was uh, uh, staunchly against Islam. May Allah bless him for whatever good works he did. He was staunchly against Islam and he wrote about this particular verse. These are his words, not mine. He says, look at the God of Muhammad. Look at the God of Muhammad. He doesn't even know whether his command is going to come by night or by day. He can't even choose. He hasn't figured it out yet. It was a criticism from Professor Haddad. Look at the God of Muhammad. He doesn't know when his command is going to come. What kind of Quran is this? What kind of Muhammad is this? What kind of prophet is this? How would you reply him? First part of the verse makes sense. Last bit doesn't make sense, does it? It does. Ayatollah Sadiqi Tahrani, may Allah bless his soul, he died about three years ago student of Sayyid Abba Tabai wrote a response. He said, no, you don't understand what this verse means. It's talking about time zones. Because at some time, part of the world is in darkness, it's, day, it's nighttime, and some part of the world is in light, it's daytime. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying very simply, there will come a time when our command will come to this world, and part of it will be by day, and part of it will be by night. SubhanAllah, beautiful response, huh? Now I'm going to pose you the question. What do you think the command refers to? Our command will come. The time when this earth will come, where it's come to industrial revolution, there will be such a level of technological advancement, at that point mankind will think that they have control over this whole world, at that point our command comes by night or by day. What is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is it? Twelfth Imam. Twelfth Imam. Our command comes by night or by day. Still doesn't make sense, does it? Hasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided when he's going to send Imam Hajjah alayhi salam? Now I'm going to pose you some questions. Either way, if you look at me or you look down, you can't be escaping it. What time and what day, according to our narrations, is Imam Hajj alayhi salam due to arrive? 
What day? Friday. Friday. What time? Dhuhr. Where? Mecca. Very simple. Mount Hajj al Islam comes when? Friday. What time? Let's just say Dhuhr. Let's just pick a time saying 12 for the sake of tw argument. 12. What day? Friday. So let's say, let's say, may Allah hasten his appearance and make it tomorrow. Let's say it's tomorrow. Okay? He's coming. Now I want you to think about time zones. Look at the verse. It's talking about time zones. Our command, Muhammad Hajj alayhi salam comes by night or by day. He comes 12 o'clock Mecca. What time will it be? What time will it be in Sydney if it's 12 o'clock Mecca? Much later. Much later. How, how, how many hours further is Sydney from Mecca? 10 hours. 10 hours. Thank you very much. So what time will it be in Sydney if it's 12 p.m. in Mecca? What time is Sydney? 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Fantastic. Now that's going this way in terms of time zone. Go the other way. If it's 12 p.m. Mecca when he comes, what time will it be in Vancouver? How many hours behind is Vancouver? Work it out for me. New York is five behind us. Fair? So that's seven behind Mecca. But it's another three hours to the other side, correct? To LA. So that's, again, ten hours the other side, correct? So if 12 o'clock Mecca, what time Vancouver? 2 a.m. So think about it. Time zones. Imam al-Hajj salam comes 12 o'clock Mecca. At one part of the world, it will be night. And in another part of the world, it will be day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this verse, there will come a time, the world will continue. Until when? Until the earth puts on its golden adornment and raiment. At that time, mankind thinks that he has control over this whole world. At that time, our command, Imam al-Hajjah, comes by day or by night. You might be in part X of the world, it will be day. You might be in part X of the world, and it will be night. Imam al-Hajjah will come by day or by night. Why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you this in regards to Thursday night? Firstly, the verse is phenomenal. Phenomenal. It really makes you think, doesn't it? That this world is a globalized world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already explained that. Time zones in the Holy Quran. But I want you to think about it in this light. We are told Thursday night is such a sanctified night. Yet, for the Western world, and I say Western world, every part of the world, Thursday night is the party night. It's the beginning of the week, the same way it's the beginning of the week for you and I, but in different ways. It's the beginning of the week for them in terms of the weekend starts on Thursday. Correct? Many of our youth are out, clubs, pubs, casino, house parties. Maybe you and I were one of those people back in the day. Alhamdulillah, we've been guided. True? But my point is this. If Imam al-Hajj comes at 12 p.m. Mecca, at some parts of the world, it's still Thursday night. Correct? Which means, although he may be coming in Mecca, and he may be raising his sword and announcing, I have arrived. There will be parts of the world that are still on Thursday night. If we, as family members, friends of our own community, can't express to our youth the importance of coming to the Husayniyyah, coming to the mosque on Thursday night, reciting Dua Kamil, reciting Surah al Yasi, reciting Ziyarat Waratha, making sure I'm in Salat al-Layl, it might be that I or my fellow brother or sister as a youth, a lover of Mawr Hajjah, will be in the club on Thursday night as he's reappearing on Friday day his time. True or not true? How am I going to be even, forget his army, how am I going to be his Shia if on a Thursday night I can't recite Dua Kamil? At that moment whilst I'm saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb, Qawwa ala khidmatika jawarihi, wa shtud ala al-azimati jawarihi, wa habi al-jidda fi khashyatik, he's announcing himself in Mecca. You see that? The world is a world, it's a real world. It's taking shape. The same time, on a Friday evening, as the sun sets after the Friday, what du'a are we recommended to be reciting? 
Da? Da? Da Samad. So imagine now if I am engaged in Da Samad and in Sydney, or I'm in New Zealand or China as a Shia. Thursday night's finished, Friday evening is finished. At that point, Imam al Mahdi is coming. Can you see why we have been given things the way we have been given? Why Thursday night is so important in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because it might be in one part of the world, it's still Thursday night when Imam al-Hajjah is coming. And in another part of the world, it might be Friday evening and Imam al-Hajjah is coming. Take Thursday night seriously. <coughs> take it so seriously. Advise your friends, your family members. Take it seriously. Because Thursday night is the night which precedes Imam al-Hajjah. You don't know where your risk is going to take you. You don't know that you're not going to be on holiday in LA or in Vancouver or living there someday. And at that moment on Thursday night, you can be reciting Da'a Kamail whilst he's arriving in Mecca. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. in the Dua of Kamail ibn Ziyad and we'll be taking it in a slightly different style. Throughout the Dua, um, Sheikh Ja'far will be almost giving some commentary in the middle of the Dua just to help us engage with it that much more. And we do request for you all to join in, um, plea for your forgiveness on this night because as Sheikh said, we don't know if tomorrow is the day. And if it is, we want tonight, we want to end it on a fantastic high. So inshallah, we'll start by sending our salutations upon Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Salah ala Muhammad wa Al Muhammad. And brothers, if we could just move forward a tad so the sisters can have a bit more space at the back. Salah ala Muhammad wa Al Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على وبقوتك التي قهرت بها كل شيء وخضعها كل شيء وذللها كل شيء وبجبروتك التي غلبت بها كل شيء وبعزتك التي لا يقوم لها شيء وبعظمتك وبعظمتك التي ملأت كل شيء وبسلطانك الذي على كل شيء وبوجهك الباقي بعد فناء كل شيء وبأسمائك التي ملأت أركان كل شيء وبعلمك الذي أحاط بكل شيء وبنور وجهك الذي أضاء له كل شيء يا نور يا قدوس يا نور يا قدوس يا يا أول الأولين ويا آخر
الآخر الآخرين اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تهتك العسم اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تنزل النقم اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تغير النعم اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تحبس الدعاء اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تنزل البلاء اللهم اغفر لي كل ذنب اذنبته وكل خطيئه اخطاتها اللهم اني اتقرب اليك بذكرك واستشفع بك الى نفسك واسالك بجودك ان تدنيني من قربك وان توزعني شكرك وان تلهمني ذكرك اللهم اني اسالك السؤال خاضع متذلل خاشع ان تسامحني وترحمني وتجعلني بقسمك راضيا قادعا وفي جميع الاحوال متواضعا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم If you notice the first part of the dua over asking and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy encompasses everything we find that this is mentioned in the Holy Quran and Amir Mu'mineen alayhi salam is expanding upon this through one particular verse and that is Surah Al-A'raf chapter number 7 of the Holy Quran verse number 156 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and we'll see that how it's identical in its wording in the opening lines of the dua he says that as for my chastisement, I will afflict it with whomsoever I please. And as for my mercy, it encompasses all things. Wasi'at kulla shay. And so I will adorn it, my mercy, especially for those people who guard against evil. My special mercy which encompasses everything already, I will adorn it for those people who are amongst the muttaqeen, those people who give out alms tax and pay up charities, and those people who believe in our communications and in our signs. So here we have this um, qualification from the Quranic perspective. It makes us think, how grand is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Actually, in the du'a later on, Imam Ali السلام, will explain how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, because in it he says, um, that I swear that even if you were to leave me the power of speech in the fires of hell, I will cry out to everyone that I love you. It makes you think that even in the pitfalls of hell, there is still mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because His mercy must touch everything. If there is something outside the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can no longer exist. By virtue of it being in existence, it must be within the encompassing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, even in the pitfalls of hell, Imam Ali al-Islam says, if you give me the power of speech, I will cry out to the inmates of hell that I love you. The other part that we can comment on is one of the lines here of istighfar where we say Allahumma gfuri ya dhunub allati tahbis al-du'a Oh Allah, forgive those things or forgive those sins which stop the du'a from reaching you One of the commentators has said that this wording is meant to um, denote, or denote almost like a hand which is, as the, the du'a is coming, you've caught the du'a so, Literally, the sins that we do are amongst the reasons as to why my du'a is not heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all have our du'a, be it for health, family, friends, wealth, opportunity to fulfill X, Y, and Z in our life. If I want those things to come to fruition, the best way 
for me to ensure is to stop that sin which I think would be the reason as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't want to accept my dua. There must be a correlation between my sin and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing me to achieve more. What is that relationship? Very simply, it is my own sin that stops me from achieving those heights, stops me from achieving the things that I want. Therefore, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me those things if I myself am not worthy and ready to achieve them myself because my sins are the things that are holding me down from that. Thus we say, Allahumma firli al dhanum al lati tahbisu dua Allahumma wa as'aluk sa'ala man ishtaddat faqatuh wa anzala bika inda shadaid hajata وعظما فيما عندك رغبته اللهم عظم سلطانك وعلى مكانك وخفيا مكروك وظهر أمرك وغلب قهرك وجرت قدرتك ولا يمكن الفرار من حكومتك اللهم لا أجد لذنوبي غافرا ولا لقبائحي ساترا ولا لشيء من عملي القبيح بالحسن مبدلا غيرك لا إله إلا جرأت بجهلي وسكنت إلى قديم ذكرك لي ومنك علي اللهم مولاي كم من قبيح سترت وكم من فادح من البلاء أقلت وكم من عفار وقيت وكم من مكروح دفعت وكم من فناء جليل لست أهلا له نشوت اللهم عظم بلائي وأفرط بي سوء حالي وقصرت بي أعمالي وكعدت بي أغلالي وحبسني عن نفعي بعد أملي وخدعت للدنيا بغرورها ونفسي بجنايتها ومطالي يا سيدي فأسألك بعزتك أن لا يحجب عنك دعائي سوء عملي وفعالي ولا تفضحني بخفي ما اطلعت عليه من سري ولا تعاجلني بالعقوبة على ما عملته في خلواتي من سوء فعلي وإساءتي ودوام ظفريتي وجهالتي وكفرتي شهواتي وغفلتي وكن اللهم بعزتك لي في كل الأحوال رؤوفا وعلي في جميع العمور أطوفا إلهي وربي من لي غيرك أسأله كشف ضري والنظر في أمري إلهي ومولاي أجريت علي حكما اتبعت فيه هوى نفسي ولم أحترس فيه من تزيين عدوي فغرني بما أهوى وأسعده على ذلك القضاء فتجاوز بما جرى علي من ذلك بعض حدود 
وخانفت بعض أمامرك فلك الحمد علي في جميع ذلك ولا حجتني فيما جرى علي فيه قضاءك وألزمني حكمك وبلاءك وقد أتيتك يا إلهي بعد تبصيري وإسرافي على نفسي معتبرا نادما منكسرا مستقيلا مستغفرا منيبا مقرا مبعدا معترفا لا أجد غفرا مما كان مني ولا مفزعا أتوجه إليه في أمري غير قبولك عفري وإدخالك إياي في سعة من رحمتك اللهم فأقبل عفري وارحم شدة غري وفكني من شدي وفاقي يا رب ارحم ضعف بدني يا رب ارحم ضعف بدني يا رب ارحم ضعف بدني ورقة جلدي ودقة عظمي يا من بيده يا من بدأ خلقي وفكري وتربيتي وبري وتغذيتي هبني لابتداء كرمك وصارف برك بي يا إلهي وسيدي وربي أتراك معذبي بنارك بعد توحيدك وبعد من انطوى عليه قلبي من معرفتك ولهج به لسان من ذكرك واعتقده ضمير من حبك وبعد صدق اعترافي ودعائي خاضعا Go back a few slides to the beginning of that. Keep going, gentlemen. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Just go for one. <coughs> one more. Ya ilahi wa sayyidi wa rabbi. Aturaku mu'addabi bina nika ba'da tawheed. Can you go? go. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. We find here that Amir um, Mumin alayhi salam provides us with almost, it might be described as a lexical order, in that of course if the highest realms of spirituality are to understand the true oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the oneness of everything in existence, then you might look at this series of lines as almost a lexical order in that Allah in that Amir Muhini alayhi salam starts at the highest potential and then shows you maybe the stages of how one can arrive at that. So read it with me and start considering that Tawheed is the highest and that below that will be another stage and I know that another stage and below that another stage. So are you really going to put me into the fires of hell after I believed in your unity? Below that, معرفتك, in that my heart has recognized you. So here, the, the, the overall concept is to arrive at a state of unity. Within that, for me to achieve that, my heart must have ma'rifa of you. It must have cognizance and penetrate veils of understanding. Next. And also, and that my tongue continuously remembered you. So that again, for me to arrive at a state of Tawheed, there must be dhikr from me. Now tongue here again can be the literal or it can be 
um, more metaphorical we find in, in the Da'a, it says at the end of this particular Da'a Kamil, it says, um, so you can see here that there is almost this, this direct link. The first thing is Imam Ali is saying that how can you really consider putting me into the fires of hell when my heart loves you, when my tongue does dhikr of you. And then at the end of the du'a, we actually pray for that. We don't forget that. You can see that there's a direct link here between the two. Meaning, when I've actually asked for this at the end of the du'a, I'm supposed to action it, and the outcome would be, how can you really put me in the fires of hell when I've done what I, what I prayed for, I've done. Therefore, you can't put me into the fires of hell. Can you see the link between that? So if you carry on, on the head of the and my mind believes in your love. Again, something that we need to bring to fruition. Next. And again, after my confession and humble supplications to your Lordship. Hey heart, anta akramu min anta the yama But here, this word hey heart, I just want to highlight it's mentioned in the Holy Quran. If you look within Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter number 23 of the Holy Quran, <coughs> verse number 36, it says, Hey heart, hey heart, lima tu alun. This is in regards to the um, story of Nabi Allah Nuh alayhi salam. The chiefs of the people at the time of Nabi Allah Nuh alayhi salam called um, the hereafter a lie. They would say, there's no such thing as the meeting of the hereafter. And they would tell themselves that if you obey a mortal, then you'll surely be amongst the losers. Then they would say, Do you, does he threaten you that when you are dead and you become dust and bones that you will be brought back? Then they would say, Hey heart, hey heart, lima tu ajun. How far, how far away is this thing that you are threatened with by the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam? Meaning that hey heart is the way you really want to say, look at the distance between this thing that is considered and its reality. How can it really be, Imam Ali alayhi salam is saying, how can it really be that you're going to put this tongue that has done dhikr of you in the fires of hell? How are you really going to put this forehead that has done such that to you in the fires of hell? That's about to come. Hey heart, anta akramu min anta dayya Far, far away is this situation from what we have conceived. You are far too generous to abandon whom you have nurtured. Hey heart, anta akramu min anta dayya amarrabbayta. أو تبعد من أدنيت أن تشرد من آويت أو تسلم إلى البلاء من كفيته ورحمت وليت شعري يا سيدي وإلهي ومولاي أتسلط النار على وجوه خرت لعظمتك ساجدا وعلى ألسن نتقت بتوحيدك صادقا وبشكرك مادحا وعلى قلوب اعترفت بإلهيتك محققا وعلى ضمائر رحوت من العلم بك حتى صارت خاشعا وعلى جوارح سعت إلى أوطاني تعبدك طائعا وأشارت باستغفارك مضعنا ما هاكب الظن بك ولا أخبرنا بفضلك عنك يا كريم يا ربي وأنت تعلم ضعفي عن قليل من بلاء الدنيا وأطوباتها Again, this dua speaks to itself like a conversation, one part speaking to the next. So previously we had, Ya Rabbi Rahman, Da'fal Badani, Wa Riqqata Jildi, Wa Riqqata Adami, 
Ya man bada khalki wa dhikri wa tabdiyati. My Lord, have mercy upon the weakness of my body, the thinness, the softness of my skin, the frailty of my body. How I've been created. Here, at that point, we might say, it might be the trials of this world. In that how easily my body can succumb to sickness. Be it the common cold, or be it the cancer, or anything of that matter. My Lord, have mercy upon the weakness of my body. But here, if you just think of things in the worldly sense, you will lose the essence of the da'a. Hence, the another part refers back to this again. Ya Rabbi wa anta ta'lamu da'fi. My Lord, you know, you're aware of my weakness. And a small amount of pain in this world causes me so much. Therefore, how can I endure and last in the pains of the next world? So the du'a speaks to itself within one point to the next. And therefore, when you are saying, Ya Rabbi Rahab Da'af al-Badani, instead of confining the tear and confining your heart to just the limit of this world's pain, the idea is to understand, no, my Lord, how weak I really am, have mercy upon the frailty of this body in the next world. And another way for us to appreciate this, if you can just go back up one or two slides if you don't mind. Uh, keep going, keep going. Yeah, brilliant. Here, again, we appreciate what things that the body should be doing in the state of worship. So for example, um, are you going to place this forehead that has done sajda to you and has done the adhamatik sajida? You know, it's, it's cognizance of your greatness during the sajda. The point here is Imam Ali Islam wants us to realize that the sajda is valueless unless it is attached to recognition of his greatness. So as I'm going into sajda, I should be feeling that. I should have that greatness of him in my heart. Otherwise, I can't use it as a point of defense against going into the fires of hell. Because it was a qualification. How can you put this forehead, not any forehead, this forehead that has done sajda to you and recognized your greatness. And this heart, and this heart which has recognized. Now I want to go slightly differently. In the grave, we know that there are certain individuals that when their bodies have been dug up, exhumed, their bodies have remained fresh. We have seen many examples in history. The most famous is someone like Hura ibn Yazid al riyahi May Allah grant us his intercession for dunya wal akhira. That when they took that handkerchief off his head, he continued to bleed. His body was as fresh as the day in which he was killed. We also have someone like Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, the great companion of Ahlul Bayt, and Allah When his body was dug up because water was entering into his grave, his body was as fresh as the day in which he was buried. In fact, his hands, according to history, had been burnt off. He had lost his hands because Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi had um, poured. Uh, boiling like like melted copper or melted iron or something like that melted or something melted um, iron uh, upon his hands and burnt his hands off his body was fresh look at these verses in light of that in the grave are you going to burn this forehead the one that did sajda and recognized you are you going to allow this heart to be burnt <coughs> and to be decimated even though it understood you and had cognizance and knowledge and recognition of you? Here we note that it's not just on day of judgment and hellfire that this face, this body remains intact by virtue of that. There is a link between my cognition and my heart being remained intact physically. Imam Ali here is talking about the physical qalb, isn't he? How are you going to punish this physical heart when it's recognized you? So here, if we want our body to remain intact, we can see the whole series of these lines. You can go down one or two more. 
Carry next one. Yeah. That my body has been in, in, in worship, my limbs have been in a state of worship of you. Next one. So because of that, I believe my body will be kept sanctified, my body will remain intact. No opinion do I hold of you in such ways. It's not just tawil, mudda. It's not just long, it's been expanded. Muddatu, it's been expanded. The misfortunes that are in the next world. Now, Imam Ali Islam in Nahj Balagha has a hadith whereby he states everything in this world appears greater when you hear about it than when you actually come to it. But everything in the next world is greater when you see it than when it's described in this world. Phenomenal. Because whatever I describe to you in this world, the reality of it, it's just going to be letter, it's just, it's not going to be that great. Even if I describe to you a Lamborghini Contash, or a, you know, the greatest palace, however much I describe it to you and adorn it to you, when you get to that thing, it's never going to be as great. It just can't be. Because the acquisition of anything in this world in the way in which our heart had been made, the acquisition of anything in this world makes us happy and satisfied that we've got it, we no longer value it. <coughs> it's always about the chase. Yeah? When I want the job, it's about the chase. When I want that person, it's about the chase. When I got that thing, my heart says, it's enough, I've got it, I'll move on to the next thing, we're never satisfied. In the next world, it's the complete opposite. And no matter how much Imam Ali Islam describes this next world, it's nothing compared to where it's actually going to be. So here Imam Ali Islam wants us to realize the difference between fi dunya and akhirah. If you don't mind, scroll down. The situation will continue. This statement. And all of these tribulations that cannot even be imagined, no matter how much it's described, it's greater when you actually get there. All of this can be understood in this way. That the whole earth, everything in the heavens and the skies could not stand up to the akhirah. How do you understand that? Very simple. In our solar system, we are the third planet away from the sun. If we were to move a hundred miles further away from the sun, what would happen? If we were to move a hundred miles closer to the sun, what would happen? In this way, even I, you and I, if we go out too long into the sun, we are burnt. And such an outcome comes to our body where we're so uncomfortable, cancers can come and so on and so forth. We ourselves can't even hack an hour in the sun 
in certain parts of this world. The whole of the next world is so great that even these heavens and these skies couldn't hack what's going to take place from the next world. Meaning, if you look at this earth, if you were to push it forward towards the sun, there would be a time when this whole earth will be incinerated by the sun. That's just one sun. Did you know there are certain studies being, being done? There is confirmed studies. Our sun is so huge. Yes? I don't know how many times small our earth is to the sun. But there are suns out there which are 2,000 the time size than our own sun. Just think about that. The largest suns known in our existent universe. How hot that sun must be. How large that sun is. You can understand this through that. That this earth couldn't <coughs> even stand this, the sun. No way this whole existence can stand up to the, what's coming in the next in the next world of existence. Ya Sayyidi Fakifani wa ana abdu kabari for Bani Iran Happy Iran Miskin Ron Mustaki. يا إلهي وربي وسيدي ومولاي لأي الأمور إليك أشكو ولما منها أضج وأبكي لألي من عذاب وشدة أم لطول البلاء ومدة فلئن صيرتني للعقوبات مع عدائك وجمعت بيني وبين أهل بنائك وفرقت بيني وبين أحبائك وأوليائك فهبني يا إلهي وسيدي ومولاي وربي with the people of your misfortunes, or will you gather me? Would you go down one, please? Will you gather me, or will you separate me from those whom you love and those who you adore? I just want to give you something profound from uh, Sahih Sajjadiyah. Um, I believe it's Dua number 47 in Sahifa. Imam Sajjad says something which is almost unfathomable. He says that he praises Imamat. He says, I, I wish I had the Sahifa in front of me, I could actually read it to you, but someone could actually get it for me if you don't mind. It'll take 10 seconds. There is a Sahifa there. Um, not that one, the English one. There's, there's one just on the table, it's just outside. Just outside. Thank you. I'll explain it to you and then I'll read you the actual line. Imam Zin <coughs> Abidin alayhi salam is an Imam, obviously which means he occupies the position of Imamat in his time. But in the Da'a, in Sahifa, he actually says that, my Lord, I want you to strengthen and make easy the needs and the... the, the he says, make easy and victorious for the Imam. Okay. Then he says, and make us amongst the Imam's supporters. Make us amongst the Imam's supporters. But the Imam is the Imam. So shouldn't he be saying, make my Shia my support? But he doesn't say that. Now an Imam doesn't say things for the sake of saying things, does he? He is a purified tongue. Which means everything has a deep level of cognizance and value to it. He says, make me, make us, amongst the Imam's supporters and followers, which means, even though he's the Imam, he has taken himself momentarily in his heart outside the realm of Imamat and <coughs> trying to support Imamat. He's looking at the other Imams and saying, I support them as the Imams. And he's praying for us to be amongst the supporters of the Imams. I'll read it to you exactly what he says. Then he says, place us in heaven with the supporters of the Imam. 
normally you would think the Imam would say, make the supporters be, oh Allah, put our supporters in heaven with us. He doesn't say that. He says, make us to be with our supporters in heaven. How highly he ranks the Shia of Al Muhammad. He wants, he wants to come to them. He's saying, unite us. Make, instead of letting the Shia come to us, we love our Shia so much, make us come to the supporters of Imamat. If you understand that point. I'll just read it to you as soon as I find it. It'll take me uh, a second to find it. So my apologies. Okay. Yeah, here we go. O oh Lord, surely you did in every age support an imam in your religion and established him as a sign for your servants. And you made him as the means of your approbation and you did dissuade mankind by, of threat by disobeying him. Okay. He is the asylum, the imam. Imam Zayn al is talking about an Imam. He's talking about someone other than himself, even though it is himself. Therefore, he, the Imam, is the asylum of those who seek shelter. I'm coming to this in a second, it's very important. Therefore, he, the Imam, whoever he's speaking about, is the asylum of those who seek shelter, the defender of the true believers. He is the support to the adherents and the light to the inhabitants of the universe. Therefore, inspire your vicegerent, doesn't say myself, he's pointing towards another imam, whoever that is. My Lord, Allahumma fa'awzi' li waliyika shukra ma an'amta bihi alayhi wa awzi'na mithlahu fihi. My Lord, inspire your vicegerent with gratitude for the favors you have conferred upon us through him. He takes himself out of imamat and appoints to the issue, he takes himself out of being the imam and supports imamat. My Lord, inspire your imam with gratitude for all the favors that you have done on us, the Shia, through the imam's position. Inspire us with gratitude towards having an imam. Give us closeness from his well-supported authority. Support him. Give him power, watch him with your eye, aid him with your angels, give him the greatest victory you can give. Speaking about another person, revive your religion through him, and so on and so forth. Then, soften his heart for your friends. Soften your Imam's heart, oh Allah, there's an Imam, whoever he may be, Zainal Abidin is saying, soften his heart towards those people that love him. Cause his hand to stretch forth against his enemies and grant us his kindness. Grant us, the Shia of this Imam, his kindness. SubhanAllah, the Imam should be saying about himself, but he's pointing towards someone else. Why do we understand this and how do we understand it to this? Imam Sadiq has the hadith where he says, If I was to live till the time of Imam al Mahdi, I would support him with all my strength. So even though he's an Imam, he's actually making himself a Shia of Imamat. Because Imam Zayn al-Abdin is looking at people like Imam Ali, looking at people like Imam Mahdi, people like Imam Hussein, and he's saying, I want to support them. Now look at this. Imam Ali is saying, on the Day of Judgment, are you really going to separate me from those who you love? But Imam Ali is that prime person who Allah loves. Who can Allah love other than Rasulullah and Imam Ali more? But yet Imam Ali is saying, don't separate me, Ali, from those people whom you love. Because even though they were Imams, they didn't recite these du'as as Imams. They recited them as genuine servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm proving it through Sahifa. Imam Zayn al-Abidin says about Imamat, 
please make me lovers of imamat. But he is imam. In the same way, Imam Ali salam says, don't separate me from those whom you love and those who, you, who adore you. Allow me to be with those on the Day of Judgment, even though he is one of those on the Day of Judgment. فَهَبْنِي يَا إِلَٰهِي وَسَيِّدِي وَمَوْلَايَ وَرَبِّي صَبَرْتُ عَلَىٰ عَذَابِكْ فَكَيْفَ أَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ فِرَاقِكْ وَهَبْنِي صَبَرْتُ عَلَىٰ حَرْ نَارِكْ فَكَيْفَ أَصْبِرُ عَنِ النَّذَرْ إِلَىٰ كَرَامَتِكْ أَمْ كَيْفَ أَسْكُنُ فِي النَّارِ وَرَجَاءِ عَفُوكْ فبعزتك يا سيدي ومولاي أقسم صادقا لئن تركتني ناطقا لأفجن إليك بين أهلها ضجيج الآمنين ولأسرخن إليك صراخ المستصرخين ولا أبكين عليك بكاء الفاقدين ولا أنادينك أين كنت يا ولي المؤمنين يا غاية أهال العارفين يا غياف المستغيفين يا حبيب قروب الصادقين ويا إله العالمين أفتراك سبحانك يا إلهي وبحمدك تسمع فيها صوت عبد مسلم سجن فيها بمخالفته وفاقت عما عذابها بمعصيته وحبس بين أطباقها بجرمه وجريرته وهو يفج إليك فجيجا معمل لرحمتك ويناديك بلسان أهل توحيدك ويتوسل إليك بربوبيتك يا مولاي فكيف يبقى في العذاب وهو يرجو ما سلف من حلمك أم كيف تؤلمه النار وهو يأمن فضلك ورحمتك أم كيف يحرقه لهيبها وأنت تسمع صوته وترى مكانا أم كيف يشتمل عليه زفيرها وأنت تعلم ضعفا أم كيف يتقلقل بين أطباقها وأنت تعلم صدقا أم كيف, ي... أم كيف تزجره زبانيتها وهو يناديك يا ربا أم كيف يرج فضلك في عتقه منها فتتركه فيها هيهات ما ذلك الظن بك ولا المعروف من فضلك ولا مشبه لما عاملت به الموحدين من برك وإحسانك فباليقين أقطع لولا ما حكمت به من تعذيب جاحديك وقضيت به من إخلاج معانديك لجعلت النار كلها بردا وسلاما وما كان لأحد فيها مقرا ولا مقاما لكنك تقدست أسماءك أفسمت أن تملأها من الكافرين من الجنة والناس أجمعين وأن تخلد فيها المعاندين وأن 
تجلفنا وكقلت مبتدئا وتطولت بالإنعام متكرما أفمن كان مؤمنا كمن كان فاسقا لا يستوون إلهي وسيدي فأسألك بالقدرة التي قدرتها وبالقضية التي حتمتها وحكمتها وغلبت من عليه أجريتها أن تهبني في هذه الليلة وفي هذه الساعة كل جرم أجرمت وكل ذنب أذنبت وكل قبيح أسررت وكل جهل عملته كتمته أو أعلنته أخفيته أو أظهرته وكل سيئة أمرت بإثباتها الكرام الكاتبين الذين وكلتهم بحفظ ما يكون مني وجعلتهم شهودا علي مع جوارحي وكنت أنت الرقيب علي من ورائهم والشاهد لما خفي عنهم وبرحمتك أخفيت وبفضلك سترت وأن توفر حظي من كل خير أنزلت أو إحسان فضلت أو بر نشرت أو رزق بسطت أو ذنب تغفره أو خطأ تستره يا ربي يا ربي يا جميع يا ربي يا ربي يا ربي يا يا إلهي وسيدي ومولاي ومالك رزقي يا من بيده ناصيته يا عليما بفري ومسكنتي يا خبيرا بفخري وفاقتي يا ربي يا ربي يا رب أسألك بحق وقدسك وعظني صفاتك وأسمائك أن تجعل أوقاتي من الليل والنهار بذكرك معمولا وبخدمتك مرسولا وأعماني عندك مقبولا حتى تكون أعمالي وأورادي كلها وردا واحدا وحاني في خدمتك سرمدا يا سيدي يا من عليه معولي يا من إليه شكوت أحوالي يا ربي يا ربي يا رب قو على خدمتك جوارحي واشتد على العزيمة جوانحي وهب لي الجد في خشيتك والدوام والدوام في الاتصال بخدمتك حتى أصرح إليك في ميادين السابقين وأسرع إليك في البارزين وأشتاق إلى قربك في المشتاقين وأدنو منك دنو والمخلصين وأخافك مخافة المؤقنين وأجتمع وأجتمع في جوارك مع المؤمنين اللهم ومن أرادني بسوء فأرد ومن كادني فكد واجعلني من أحسن عبيدك نصيبا عندك 
وأقربهم منزلة منك وأخصهم زلفة لديك فإنه لا ينال ذلك إلا بفضلك وجودني بجودك وعطف علي بمجدك واحفظني برحمتك واجعل لساني بذكرك لهجا وقلبي بحبك متيما ومن علي بحسن إجابتك وأقني عفرتي واغفر زلتي فإنك قضيت فإنك قضيت على عبادك بعبادتك وأمرتهم بدعائك وظننت لهم الإجابة فإليك يا ربي نصبت وجهي وإليك يا ربي مددت يدي فبعزتك استجب لي دعائي وبلغني مناي ولا تقطع من فضلك رجائي واكفني شر الجن والانس من اعدائي يا سريع الرفا يا سريع يا من اسمه دواء وذكره شفاء وطاعته غنى إرحام من رأس ماله الرجاء وسلاحه وسلاحه البكاء يا صابغ النعم يا دافع النقم يا نور المستوحشين في الظلام يا عالم لا يعلم صل على محمد وآل محمد وافعلني ما أنت أهله وصلى الله على رسوله والأئمة الميامين من آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا In relation to the du'a, I know time is a little bit late, um, but insha'Allah, Dr. Ali Fana is here, so we should try and take as much wealth of knowledge away from him, not away, but for him to give it to us, and insha'Allah, further his knowledge. So if you do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, insha'Allah. Pertinent to, to the du'a, if any further explanation from Sheikh Jafar's points, or even any parts that we may not have covered, any parts that you have. Any queries or questions or anything about the reform? No? Oh, not at all, no? Not even one question? Sure. Everyone wants their tea. <laughs> sure. Please. Oh, you go. Know. Oh, um, could you kindly uh, elaborate on the frontier? <laughs> um, for our benefit, if you could kindly um, elaborate on the uh, the philosophy behind the saying of the Dua Salat al Mumin, that the Dua is the weapon of the believer. Uh, would you give us some feedback on that? Yeah. <laughs> 
And um, you know, there's a part of Dua Kumel that says, um, "Whoever wishes evil on me, wish it upon them." And I'm just wondering, it's not like you know any of us believers to wish evil on anyone. So how would you explain that? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Could you repeat it? Um, you know. interpretation to this and said that the translation is very bad it doesn't mean return the evil to them so that they feel it it means return it to them meaning that it never reaches me let it just stay with them because people it, it, protect, me from. protect me from their evil so that it never reaches me return it to them so it stays with them and never comes to me so someone may feel envious don't let that envy come reach me Someone may want to do X to me. Just let it stay with them. 
as opposed to ever reaching me. As you said, um, he himself stated, it's not for the believer. Imam Ali salam, would never hope that evil befalls um, upon someone else. Um, if you go to the Wahwa side of it, um, there's that statement, who is greater, you or Nuh alayhi salam? If you believe the narration, he says, I am greater than Nuh, because Nuh prayed for destruction upon his own community. I've been given such level of oppression, but I've never prayed against them. So if you take that, that would be in opposition to the du'a. Imam Ali alayhi salam couldn't be in opposition to himself. Sorry, no. Sorry, I'm taking further from uh, your explanation. I'm also confused and uh, I always wonder because in Dry Alkama, same thing appears, similar sort of thing that we should want to, those who wish to us. So, why would then Allah say this thing? And, well, when you are saying that then we don't wish. The same thing back to them. It, it says that uh, Allah protect us from the evil of uh, these people. And uh, in al it goes into much, much more depth than this uh, like on uh, So what you are saying is that uh, just don't wish any bad to them. Th that is what the uh, doctor said and probably you are adding to that. The interpretation that we were given when, yeah. when we studied this Study, the interpretation we were given when we studied this was Imam Ali is not saying send the evil back to them, that it reaches them, meaning confine it with them so it never gets to me. Can you see the difference between the two? If I wish evil upon you in this scenario and you recite that line of du'a, either you can be praying for it to come back to me, which means I suffer the same ill consequence that I was originally <coughs> hoping for you, or the interpretation is that it should be confined to me and never reach you. If it's confined to me, it just stays with me. And therefore, I can't, all I can do is wish the evil, but it never reaches you. It stays with me. So we pray that it just reaches within you, it doesn't reach you. Well, the ultimate prayer will always be for them never to have that evil within their heart in the first place. So. If we're going to pray, we should pray for someone's betterment. I mean, this is uh, my humble opinion, a humble opinion, um, the childish way that we have been taught uh, la'na, you know, every time something goes wrong, I just give la'na upon Al Saud, I give la'na upon, you know, George Bush, I need la'na upon them, but instead of just doing la'na upon them, I should be firstly praying for their guidance. So that would be the op in my humble opinion, that would be the optimum way in order to engage in that da'a. I don't think so because pins and needles have inflamed my body like mad, so uh, I think inshallah we'll end there. Um, on this note, if I could please ask you to recite the sort of about the advice I have for the sawab of Ali Asghar Morali and the sawab of the Morali and the Bawani family, sort of about the advice.